Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. So we're starting a new session, new series of classes. So it'll be a five-week session, inshallah, on uh, covering the chapter on sincerity and significance of intentions and all actions apparent and hidden. This is from the book uh, Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam al-Nawi. We're going to cover this first chapter, which has about uh, 12 hadith, 12 hadith in total. All right. Um, today we're going to be focusing on just the first hadith and um, and a little bit getting a little bit technical with some issues related to intention. And then after that, we'll uh, in the rest of the sessions focus on explaining the hadith. All right. Uh, so uh, we have two terms, two very important terms that uh, are the subject of this chapter. The, the first term is al-ikhlas, which translates to mean sincerity. And niya, and niya, which translates to mean intention. All right, so we have these two terms. So it is important to know these two terms, al-ikhlas and an niya. Right, these are the two terms that are the entire this entire class is going to revolve around. All right. So the first uh, question is, what is the difference between sincerity and intention? All right, what is the difference between sincerity and intention? Are they the same thing? Or are they two different things? Anybody? Two different things. So they are kind of they are you know they are used interchangeably, but uh, they can be used interchangeably. However, there is a difference between the two. So sincerity is kind of like the first step. All right. So sincerity is basically asking the question: Who are you doing the action for? All right. Who are you doing the action for? It's either for Allah Subhanahu wa Taala or for other than Allah. All right. So once that is covered, and that when it, once that is set, then the next step, level two, is intention. All right, so intention is more uh, something that the scholars of fiqh will discuss and be concerned with. Sincerity is something more the scholars of uh, spirituality will be concerned with. All right, so the first step is, who are you doing the action for? If it is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is sincerity, this is ikhlas. All right, then after that, the action itself comes in the role of the niya, the intention. So the intention, if you just remember one word, which is uh, the intention, intention is there to, uh, in Arabic we, so, we say tamiz. Intention is there to basically distinguish. Distinguish between actions. All right, distinguish between actions. So the first step is having the action for, solely for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then after that, uh, the next step is the intention which is going to distinguish between various things. So, for example, uh, you have certain actions that if you do it, it can be an act of worship and it can be a normal action. Right? It can be an act of worship and it can be a normal action. Such as what? Okay, work. But in terms of, all right, let's leave that aside. In terms of acts of worship. Yeah. Hmm? Salah, it can, that can be a normal act, possibly. All right, let's think about something like uh, when you make uh, ghusl, right? Um, uh, take a ritual bath, right? Somebody can take a bath because they want to clean themselves, all right? Or they want to cool off, all right? And somebody can take a bath for a Jum'ah, right? So on the outside, it looks completely the same, all right? On the outside, it looks look the same. This person is taking a bath because they want to clean themselves and freshen up. Another person is taking a bath because they're taking a bath for Jum'ah. So what is it that distinguishes between the two? It is the intention. All right? So this is the, pur the purpose of the intention is to distinguish between what? To distinguish between an act of worship that can be confused with a normal action. All right? So a person taking a bath. You can take a bath because it is Jum'ah. Or you can take a bath because you want to freshen up. So what, what is the, the, the purpose of the intention is to distinguish between those two actions. Right? Also, another purpose of the intention is to distinguish between acts of worship that can be uh, mistaken for the other. Or, or two acts of worship that are similar to the other. Right? So for example, somebody comes up uh, and, they, and, they, and they pray uh, two rakats, right? Uh, in the morning, let's say, right, it's Fajr time, and somebody's praying two rakat. 
All right, that two rak'ah, it could be for either the sunnah before fajr, or it could be the, the two rak'ah of fajr. All right, they look the exact same. All right, you're praying the two rak'ah, you're doing rakur, you're getting up from rakur, you're doing sujood. All right, it's the same actions, same amount of rak'ah, but what's the difference? Is that the intention is distinguishing between one is fard and what the other is sunnah. All right, so the intention is there to distinguish. Right? Just remember this word, distinguish. The intention is there to distinguish. Sincerity is there to determine who are you doing the act for. All right, so that's basically the introduction to these two terms. I will start off with the first hadith. Amir al Mu'minin, Abi Hafs, Umar al Khattab, Ibn Mufail, Ibn Abdul Uzza, Ibn Riyah, Ibn Qart, Ibn Razah. I'm not going to read the whole entire, he brings the entire name of Umar al Khattab, his, his uh, entire lineage. Um, who says that سَمِعْتُ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يَقُولُ إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى فَمَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ مَنْ كَانَتْ هِجْرَتُهُ لِدُنْيَا يُصِيبُهَا أَوْ إِمْرَأَةٍ يَنْكِحُهَا فَهِجْرَتُهُ إِلَى مَا هَاجَرَ إِلَيْهِ Alright, the Messenger صلى الله عليه وسلم says in the hadith that uh, and this hadith is narrated by uh, Umar ibn Khattab maybe uh, uh, towards the end we can mention a few things about Umar ibn Khattab but let's go on to the hadith first that uh, the Messenger وسلم, said the deeds are considered by the intentions and a person will get the reward according to his intention so whoever immigrated for Allah and his Messenger his immigration will be for Allah and his Messenger and whoever immigrated for worldly benefits or for a woman, a woman to marry his immigration for, 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 would be for what he immigrated for Alright, uh, so this is the first hadith, very important, significant hadith. So uh, essentially this entire class will be focusing on this hadith. Alright, hadith number one. Alright, so as we mentioned, the narrator's hadith is Umar ibn al-Khattab. Uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab, of course, is the uh, second uh, khalifa after Abu Bakr radiallahu an. Uh, he was, uh, he accepted Islam very early on. And uh, he was, of course, well known for many qualities and attributes. And we'll try to, inshallah, if we have time, come back to mentioning some, uh, um, some points about Umar radiallahu anhu. All right, significant is that this hadith, this hadith is very important, very important hadith. According to some of the scholars, it is one-third of Islam. All right, according to some of the scholars, they say this hadith is one-third of Islam. Other, others mention one-fourth of Islam. Uh, it's also mentioned that this hadith enters into 70 chapters of fiqh. And when they say 70, it doesn't mean the actual number 70. It just means that it, it, it's, it's a part of a number, a large number of chapters of fiqh. All right. Uh, the scholars have used this hadith to start off many of the uh, works, many books. If you look at many books, the, the first hadith they usually start off with is this hadith. All right. And the, and the best example for that is this, uh, this book that uh, we're studying here, Riyadh al-Salihin. This is the very first hadith he brings. Right, also, Imam al-Bukhari, in his uh, Sahih compilation of hadith, the very first hadith he brings uh, is this hadith as well. And this is a trend amongst the scholars that they would start off with this hadith to show its significance and importance. So, uh, first hadith to start off many books. All right, as we mentioned, the, di the difference between ikhlas and niyyah. Ikhlas is sincerity. Niyyah is intention. All right, so ikhlas is for Allah's sake and, uh, and no one else. Right, so we said that ikhlas, we can translate to mean sincerity, and essentially means that you're doing an action only for Allah and no one, no one else. All right, so that's step number one, level number one. All right, once any action you approach, the first thing, you know, the first thing that should, uh, the first step should be, who am I doing this action for? Is it for Allah or is it for other than Allah? All right, after that, the intention comes in to differentiate between actions. All right, so the purpose of the intention or the niyyah is to differentiate between actions. So the first category of the, the, the niyyah is to distinguish between worship and custom. As we mentioned, all right, there are certain actions that you do that they, it looks, it can be an act of worship or it cannot be an act of worship. As we gave the example of the uh, ghusl, right, taking a bath. A person takes a bath. A right, person can be taking a bath for Jummah or for any other reason to pray, because they they're in a state of janab, they need to pray. Or a person is taking a bath because they want to cool off or they want to freshen up. All right, so the niyyah comes in and it distinguishes between worship and custom. Right? It distinguishes between worship and custom. 
What is the difference between a person doing this action, intending to be an act of worship, or other than that? All right, so the niyyah distinguishes between worship and custom, and the niyyah also distinguishes between similar acts of worship. All right, so you have, as an example, we gave salah. All right, what, is it, what is it that distinguishes between a person praying dhuhr, or they're praying asr, or praying sunnah, or praying fard? It is the niyyah, it is the intention. All right, so this is the entire purpose of the niyyah for these two things. And in addition, it could also change acts of custom into acts of worship. All right, so a person can do an act that's a normal act. All right, that's not a, it's, a, it's not an intrinsic act of worship. But the intention will come in and it can transform that action into an act of worship. For example, like what? You gave that example earlier. Which is what? Work, right? So explain how that can be an act of worship. Okay, good. So a, a, pers- a, a man has an obligation to provide for his family. All right, so he goes to work. All right, so that act of uh, go, uh, going to work, it doesn't, it's not an act of worship, right? There's no reward in it, intrinsically, by itself. But then a person, they intend by that uh, act of going to work that I'm doing this to provide for my family. So now that action, which was previously just a normal, regular action, with the intention has now transformed into an act of worship. And so now that person can actually be rewarded for that, uh, for that action. All right? Um, so the, the niyyah comes and it transforms an act of worship or, or transforms a normal action into an act of worship. All right, we see similar with uh, when it comes to uh, in the hadith, Rasulullah uh, speaks about a man approaching his wife. Right? A man approaching his wife. And the sahaba, uh, they were confused and they asked, you know, how is it a person can get ajr? You can get ajr uh, from a, a, a person approaching his wife uh, in the marital relations. So Rasulullah said to them, he said that, isn't, the, isn't it that if he, puts, if, if he does this action in haram, he will get a sin? Right? If he does it uh, in haram, he will get a sin. He will be sinful for doing so. And he said, of course, yes. And so he said, Rasulullah answered, he said afterwards, well, if he does it in a halal manner, with the intention, then he will get a reward. All right? So this is a... An act, uh, an act that is not an intrinsic act of worship, but with the intention, it transforms into an act of worship. All right, so the niyyah is there to, number one, distinguish between worship and custom. All right, what is it that distinguishes between a person taking a bath for freshening up and, clean, and cleanliness versus a person taking a bath for Salatul Jum'ah? It is the intention. If you don't have that intention, then you don't have the reward. All right, if you, if you didn't have that intention, then you lose the reward. All right. The second purpose of the niyyah is to distinguish between similar acts of worship. A person is going uh, at uh, Salatul Fajr time, and they're going to pray the Salatul Fajr Fard. All right. If they don't have the intention of praying Salatul Fajr as a Fard, then this act is not going to be considered. All right. Because otherwise, this two rakats that they pray it could have been two rakats of Sunnah before the before the Fajr. Or it can be two rakats of general nafil. So if you don't have that intention, then the act is not going to be considered. All right? And so it goes back to the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَةِ That actions are by their intentions. In other words, for that act to be considered, to be valid, in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you need to have that intention. Otherwise, the action has no meaning. Alright, so this is the purpose of the intention. Is that clear? Of the purpose of the intention. So, right, so we said that the first thing, when it comes to action, the first thing you do is you start off with the concept of ikhlas, sincerity, which is who you're doing the action for. All right, uh, once that has been in place, you're doing the action for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then the niyyah steps in and now it distinguishes between the actions. All right, an action can be for worship, can be for custom. So the niyyah comes, the intention comes, and it specifies that this action is for worship. Right? Or a person can be doing an act of worship, and this act of worship resembles another act of worship. And so the niyyah comes in, and it specifies that this act of worship is praying dhuhr. I'm praying dhuhr, not praying asr. Right? Or I'm praying fard, I'm not praying sunnah. Right? Or I'm fasting for Ramadan, I'm not fasting because it's Monday. So acts of worship that are similar, that can be mistaken for each other, the niyyah comes in and it distinguishes between that. Right? And then the niyyah can also come and it can 
change an act of custom into an act of worship. All right, moving on. So what actions require a niyyah? Right, so the next question would be, what actions require a niyyah? Does every act of worship require a niyyah? Yes or no? Yes? All right, anybody says no? Every act of worship requires a niyyah? All right, so the answer is no. Not every act of worship requires a niyyah. All right, um, and if you were to make that the case, then a lot of actions would kind of be void and no, right? Like when you recite Quran, or when you, after you finish uh, Salah, and you say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, and you do Tasbih, all right, do you, you know, in, make that intention, or do you just do it, you know, after Salah, and you do it habitually? All right, for many people, all right, the Salah finishes, and you do the, the Tasbih, and you do the Dhikr after the Salah, and a lot of times, people don't have that intention, all right? It's just something that they're doing. So, if we say that intention is required for all these acts of worship, then if you make dhikr and you didn't have the intention, then that dhikr doesn't count, right? So it's not necessarily the case that every action requires a niyyah. All right, so what actions require a niyyah? Ibadah that resembles adah. So ibadah is acts of worship. Adah are things that are normal, normally done, right? That are not acts of worship. So any act of worship that can resemble a normal action then it is required, a niyyah is required. And we gave the example of the bath, right? So a person takes a bath. And we don't know whether that person, you, if you look on the outside, it looks like that person is either, they can either be doing it for an act of worship, for Jummah, for example, or they're doing it for freshen up and being clean. So that act, in order for that person who is doing that, the ghusl of Jummah, they need to have an intention. That requires an intention. Right, because this action resembles a normal action. So any act of worship that resembles a normal action, right, it requires an intention. Or, like somebody, or somebody making wudu, right? Somebody is, uh, you go to make wudu because it's really hot outside and you wanna, you, know, you wanna wash your face and you wanna wash your hands, maybe you wash your feet, right? So a person might be doing this because they want, you know, they wanna cool off. So in this case, a knee is required because this action it resembles something that a person might do for a non-act of worship. So any act of worship that can be mistaken for a normal action requires an intention. All right? And any act of worship, any ibadah that resembles other ibadah, as we said, also requires an intention. All right? So a person is praying. What is it that distinguishes between dhuhr and asr? They're, they're both four rakats. All right? They're, they're both the same exact... Uh, motions and, and, and pillars of the salah. Everything is the same. The thing that distinguishes your dhuhr from your asr is the niyyah. So salah requires a niyyah because salah can be fard, it can be sunnah, right? It can be mandatory, it can be recommended, right? And there are different types of salah that's, rec uh, that's recommended. There's different types of salah that is uh, obligated, right? So we have the five daily salah. All of these are obligations. So salah is something that requires an intention because a person can be praying and the prayer can be fard or it can be sunnah. Or they can be praying and it can be salat al-dhuhr, it could be salat al-asr, or it could be or salat al-isha and so on. So salah requires an intention because it is an act of worship that has, that has different categories underneath it that resemble each other. And the only thing that distinguishes between them is the, is the, is the niyyah. All right, same thing when it comes to fasting. Right? A person is fasting. What is it that distinguishes a person fasting a sunnah fast for Monday or fasting Thursday versus fasting obligatory, obligatory fast in the month of Ramadan? It is the intention. All right? So any act of worship that resembles uh, another act of worship requires an intention. Any act of worship that resembles a normal action requires an intention. All right? So the next question is, what acts of worship do not require an intention? All right? It would be anything else other than this. All right? Anything that does not fall into these first two categories, it does not re require an intention for you to, for that action to be considered. All right? So what does not resemble an ada, ada is a normal action. What does not resemble an ada nor, or other ibadah, it is not, an, uh, an intention is not required. Intention is not required. All right? So included in this are actions that are re required to leave off. Right, so there are certain things that Allah has commanded us not to do. 
All right? Do not drink alcohol. All right? Do not commit zina. All right? Do not do this. Do not do that. All right? These things we are required to leave off. Does it require a niyyah for you to, uh, for, for, you, for it to be valid? No. All right? It does not require a niyyah. However, if you want to obtain reward, it requires a niyyah. So there's a bit of a technicality here. Right? So for, for a person to avoid alcohol, all right, do, you, do you need a niyyah to, re, to avoid alcohol? You don't. Right? Because this, these are actions you're required to leave off. It's called turuk. In Babi turuk. And the turuk, they don't require a niyyah. So you leave off an action that Allah has prohibited you to do. It doesn't require you to intend. I'm intending to leave off this action. Right? Because you don't need to intend that. You just leave it off. But if you want to be rewarded for it, then you need to intend. So if somebody is like a, an opportunity presents itself where you know, there's alcohol on the table and somebody tells you to drink, and you leave it off, you're not going to get rewarded for it unless you intend. So you, to attain the reward, you need to intend. But just the mere action of leaving off anything that we're required to leave off, it does not require uh, intention. All right, things like dhikr and recitation of Qur'an. So recitation of Qur'an, right, as we said before, if a person recites Qur'an, does that resemble any other act of worship? No, right? Does it resemble any normal action? No. Right? If a person is reciting Quran, that's the only thing that it can't be confused with anything else. And so you don't you don't you don't need to intend before you recite pick up the mushaf, I intend in my heart that I'm gonna recite Quran. You don't need that intention. Alright, because it doesn't resemble any other act of worship. It doesn't res it doesn't resemble any uh, any normal action. And so dhikr, recitation of Quran, if a person uh, makes the adhkar after salah. Right, they do the tasbih, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. They don't need to, before they do the tasbih, make that intention, I'm doing, I'm doing tasbih. Or I'm doing, uh, making, making, I'm doing takbir or tahmeed. You don't need to make that intention. Of course, you know, if you want, you know, it's good to do that. But it is not required for that action to be valid. Right? So in other words, after salah, a person, they make tasbih, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, 33 times. They didn't have any intention. Right? Nothing was going through their heart or their mind. Is that action valid? It's valid. Right? It's valid even though they didn't really intend it, because this action is, it doesn't resemble any other act of worship, and it, is, it doesn't uh, resemble any normal action. And so it is not intended, or it is not required for a person to, to make that uh, formal intention for you to uh, be, uh, for that dhikr to be considered, or that dhikr to be valid. All right, things like repaying debts, right? A person owes a debt. Right? It is required in Islam to pay off your debts. Right? Do, you do, do you require an intention to pay off your debt? No. Right? So let's say somebody owes a debt to somebody else, and you go and you pay that debt off on their behalf without them knowing. Right? Can they come and say that, well, I didn't intend for you to pay off the debt, so therefore it's not valid? No, right? because what is important is that the debt is paid off. It doesn't matter if you intended or you didn't intend. It doesn't matter who paid it off. The important thing is that that debt is paid off. So things like paying off debts don't require an intention. All right, actions of the heart don't require intention. All right, such as tawakkul, reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, fear you know, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, hope. These don't, they don't require intention. All right, uh, because the intention is an act of, of the heart to begin with. So if we require actions of the heart to also have an intention, then this would lead to you know, kind of like a, a circle where you need an intention to have an intention and then you need an intention to have an intention and you, you, you just keep going on like that. So actions of the heart, they don't require an intention. Right? You don't need an intention for that. Yeah. Yeah. They might not receive the full reward for it, but, that, but the dhikr is still valid. Right? So we're talking about is that, is, that action, is, that, is that action considered or not considered? Or is it invalid or valid? So that would come under ikhlas. So if, if, they didn't, if, they're, if they're absent-minded, right, that, would come, that would come under niyyah, basically, right, because they're, 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 their niyyah is not there. But uh, for, for the reward to come, for them to, be, you know, to get that full reward, their, mind will, their heart should be in it. Right, so that would be ikhlas, to get the reward for it. But the niya part of it, whether that action is valid or not. Is it action valid? Is it valid? Or not? 
it's valid. Right? You make dhikr, whether you intend it or not, the action is valid. All right? If you want to get the reward for it, then your heart needs to be there right, to achieve the reward. But just the act of reciting Quran right, or you know, doing any type of dhikr, then what is, uh, is an intention is not required. Intention, specific intention not required. But if you want to get the full reward for it, then you know, your heart needs to be present. Mm-hmm. When the time comes, you know, you just do it automatically. Right. So you have intention at the very beginning. Let's see if it could happen in the month of Ramadan. In the month of Ramadan, you make intention like on the fast the fourth month. Mm-hmm. Right? But when the particular thing comes itself the night before, you didn't give that, you didn't make, you didn't, re- you didn't renew that intention. You just have intention at the beginning of the month for the whole month. How does that look like? Okay, so the question is about the person, for example, intending before the action. All right, so this comes back to what is actually the intention. And the intention is something that must be, is present at the time of doing the action or at the beginning of the action. So if you intend something before the action, then uh, from, uh, from a, like a legal Islamic perspective, this would not be considered intention. This would be something called azam, which is like... Um, uh, having like the determination, right? Determ- maybe de- de- determination to do something. But this, like for example, I intend to pray Salat al-Maghrib and I make that intention now. This would not be considered niya, Islamically. This would be considered azam, right? But when the time for Maghrib comes in and now I'm starting, to, I'm standing up to pray and I have that intention, this is what is considered for intention. So before that, it is not considered intention. This would be considered azam, which is determination. Uh, and that's something else. That's other than intention. All right, so uh, when it comes to like uh, fasting, th- what is required is to have that intention at the time when a person is uh, able to make that intention, which is the night before. But when it comes to fasting, though, there is another position where you can make that intention at the beginning of the month. So that, there are some details with that, making it whether it has to be every single night or whether it has to be, uh, if it's sufficient to do it at the beginning of the month. All right, that's a separate topic. Uh, but something like uh, the example you gave at the beginning, which is reciting Quran. If you make that intention in the morning to recite Quran for the afternoon, that would not be technically a, an intention. That would be just a determination to, to do something. All right? uh, but then when you actually go to do the thing and you have that intention, that's what the actual intention is. But as you said, like when it comes to recitation of Quran, it's not required to have that intention uh, and as well as uh, dhikr and so on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. So, I, uh, we had mentioned it at, at the beginning, right? The first step is sincerity, right? So uh, as we had uh, discussed at the beginning, the difference between sincerity and intention is that sincerity is the first step, which is who is this action for? All right, who is it for? Is it for Allah or is it for other than Allah? All right, once that, that, once that has been determined, then the next step is the niya, which will then distinguish between acts of worship. All right, but if the act of worship does not require niya, then it will only be sincerity, right? That's, that's the only factor. All right, that would be the only factor. So you can have, you can be, you can be reciting for Allah sincerely, but you didn't necessarily have that, like that intention didn't cross your heart when you were reciting, right? So this is the question. That intention didn't cross my heart. I didn't, you know, in, in, uh, intend in my heart that I'm reciting Quran for Allah's sake. Is it still valid or is it not valid? It's valid, all right? It's valid. And that, it doesn't require a specific intention. Is that clear? All right, so uh, actions of the heart don't require an intention. 
All right. Um, so anything that we're required to leave off, that's doesn't require an intention. Things like dhikr or recitation of Quran, things that cannot be confused for other acts of worship or cannot be uh, confused for normal actions, don't require a uh, specific intention. Repaying debts don't require an intention. Actions of the heart, they don't require an intention. All right. So as we said, the only thing that the acts of worship that require an intention are those actions that resemble other acts of worship. Right? Like the salawat, they resemble each other. So you need to distinguish when you are praying dhuhr from when you're praying asr and so on. Or when you're praying afar from when you're praying a sunnah. Or actions, acts, actions that can be uh, confused or can be mistaken for normal actions. Like a person is uh, taking a bath and they are intending the bath for Jummah. And then the person is taking a bath intending uh, cleanliness. All right? So that requires an intention. Other than that, other acts of worship don't require an intention. Meaning a formal intention that you need to, at the beginning of this act of worship, intend in your heart before it's valid. All right? Which means that any other act of worship requires an intention. Before you stand for salah, you need to have that intention in your heart that I'm praying salatul maghrib, for example. All right? if, that act, if that intention is not there, then it's a problem. All right? Because now, you, this, uh, this act of worship, it, 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 uh, according to the hadith, right, the, the hadith we're discussing, Actions are by intention, meaning actions are valid by intentions. If you didn't have any intention, then that action is invalid. Or it will be invalid because you didn't have that intention. Alright, uh, now, what happens when a person does not have uh, even a choice to make an intention? Alright, in that case, a person is not held accountable. Alright, so for example, uh, action done under duress. Somebody forces you to do something. All right? a, a person is under coercion. They're forced to do something. They had no intention of doing it. Are they held accountable for that? No. All right? Because they had no choice to begin with. The, the intention was not a choice. All right? Or a person did, did something out of forgetfulness. So they didn't have that intention. They did something out of forgetfulness. Then that person is not held accountable for that. All right, or a person does something out of a mistake, uh, a mistake they made. They didn't intend, they didn't have that uh, intent to do something. They did it out of, uh, out of error. Then they are not held responsible for that. And it comes in the hadith that Rasulullah says in the hadith that إن الله تجاوز عن أمتي الخطأ والنسيان ومستكره علي That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has overlooked for my nation الخطأ uh, The things that they've, they've done out of error, they've mistaken. What uh, nisyan things that they've done out of uh, forgetfulness, or mastukrihu alayhi, and things that they have done uh, out, out of coercion, being forced to do so. Right? So, what's the common denominator between these three things is that there is no intent involved. Right? They didn't have that option to make any intention. And so, because of that, there, these actions are not, uh, these actions will not be, they're not held accountable for these actions. All right, moving on. Any, any questions on that point? Yeah. Okay. All right, question. I'm not, uh, if we're not sure how many far fasts we have to make up, is it permissible for when fulfilling sunnah to fast to make an intention as if I don't have any far to fast to make up? This fast is for the white days, days of the hijjah. So a person owes uh, a far fast. They're not sure how much... Uh, how much fast they owe. So uh, the question is, if they're doing a sunnah fast, can they make that intention? So uh, when you're making an intention, it's either going to be one or the other. Right? It's either this fast is an, is, a, is an obligatory fast, in which the intention is for that, or it is a sunnah fast, the intention is for that. So, if you, if, if a, so for example, like a person is fasting in the month of Ramadan, it would not be valid to also intend to fast for anything else besides Ramadan. Right? So Ramadan can only be fasting Ramadan. And same thing when you're making up the fast of Ramadan, it can only be for that intention of making up. So you wouldn't be able to combine that, uh, uh, making it up specifically for that. Uh, so what you would do is you would, you would you, you, you need to try to estimate how many, how many days you missed. So if you're not sure, you try to estimate how many days you missed and go based on that. Right? You estimate how many days you missed based on that. And you, you try to be conservative with that. So... Um, I'm not sure how many days I missed. It can be anywhere from 10 to 30 days. Then fast 30 days, all right, if you're not sure. And be on the, on the conservative side. 
if you, uh, just to make sure that you have for sure made up what, you're, what you need to make up. Yeah. Yes. So Ashur is Monday. You have you had the you, you have a habit of fasting on Mondays. Yes. And then Ashura comes in and you fast on Monday. Yes. Right. Yeah, so you intend both. You can intend both. You can intend both and you can get a reward for both. All right? But the question specifically about the, the, the obligatory fast, you need to have the specific attention when you're making up that this is a fast that I missed that was obligatory that I'm making up. So it would not suffice if a person just uh, intends sunnah and hoping that it's going to make up for that fast. They have to have a specific intention of um, fasting to make up that fast. All right? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You, you have the niyyah of sunnah, sunnah fast. It's not obligatory, so you have a niyyah that this is a sunnah fast. Optional, optional fast. You make that intention that it's an optional fast. Yeah. Coming back to the Ramadan, mm -hmm. uh, the question is about if you miss fasting Ramadan, do you have to make it up? Uh, or can you do other fasts besides that? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the area of dispute amongst the scholars whether you can uh, intend to make it up along with the sunnah of, of the six days of Shawwal, for example. There's, there is a difference of opinion amongst that. The best thing is to make up everything that you need to make up first. And then do the uh, and, do, and then do the optional fast. There are some scholars who say that you can you can combine between both, but the safest thing to do is to make up all all the fast that you owe, and then and then do the, the optional fast, all right? And that's the that's the best the, uh, the best way to do it. All right, uh, continuing on, ruling on multiple intentions. All right, so sometimes uh, a person, so we know, we know that any act of worship you do. It needs to be solely for Allah's sake. All right? But what happens if a person is doing an act of worship and it is for Allah, but it is also for other than Allah? All right? So there's kind of a combining of intentions here or sharing of intentions. All right? This is called tashriku niya, where a person is uh, sharing their intention between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, so firstly, uh, ikhlas is a condition for niyyah, meaning that when you make an intention, it needs to be solely and sincerely for Allah and Allah alone. All right, it cannot be for any, anybody else other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the sign of ikhlas is that that action you do, it would be the same in public or private. This is the sign. How do you, how do you know if this act is sincerely for Allah or it is not sincerely for Allah? The... The, the, the measure we use to see that is look at that action is, it, is that action going to be in the same public or private so if that action has a different way in public than it would be in private then there's a problem with a person's sincerity All right, so if that action remains the same in public and private then this is a sign that this action is sincerely for Allah's sake All right, but if that action will change so a person for example they're praying and their salah begins to alter when, some, when people are around. Now it goes from being, uh, you know, 10 seconds when you're praying by yourself and all of a sudden some, you know, people are around and it's, it turns into two minutes, three minutes in, in one rakah. Right? Now there's a problem, right? So if that action changes when there's people around versus when in private, then this is a sign that this, this action is not being done sincerely. All right, now you have the, we have the concept called riya. Riya is doing an action for other than Allah's sake, or as we say, showing, right, for show. Performing an action for other than Allah, and this is called riya. Ar riya. Ar All right, so what is the ruling on ar riya? If it is anything that is done for other than Allah is automatically rejected. 
Right? So if you intend an action for other than Allah, uh, a person prayed, and the only reason why they prayed is for somebody to see them, then automatically, no, no dispute, that action is rejected, and it is not valid. All right, what happens if a person <coughs> intended for Allah, and they also intended for other than Allah? So I'm praying. Half of my salah is for Allah's sake alone. The other half is for somebody else. So now they have associated that act of worship uh, that belongs only to Allah with other than Allah. That action is also rejected. Right? That actual action is also rejected. And there's hadith on this in which Rasulullah says, uh, Hadith Qudsi, that Allah, Allah Azza says in Hadith Qudsi, Ana agna shuraka an shirk. That I am the one who is uh, least in need of having any partners. So whoever does an action for other than Allah's sake, Allah says, Taraktuhu wa shirkahu. I will leave him and I will leave his shirk. So if a person has, uh, they're, they're doing an act of worship and like 90% of it is for Allah, but 10% is for somebody else, then the action is, Allah will not consider that action. Right? It doesn't matter the percentage. It needs to be purely for Allah's sake alone in order for, that, for Allah to accept that action. Allah does not accept that he has partners in his actions, in any act of worship. فَمَنْ uh, يَعْمَلْ was it also in the, in the last verse uh, of Surah Al-Kaf. Um, anybody remember that verse? How does it begin? Yeah. Whoever hopes to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then let him do do acts uh, do, do good actions. And let him not associate anyone in Allah's worship with Allah. Alright, so any act of worship needs to be pure 100 percent for Allah's, Allah's sake alone. So if anything else, anybody else is considered besides Allah, then that action will be rejected. Alright, now, what about if a person does an action, alright, and they intend, so they're not doing it for anybody else's anybody else's sake, but it's another reason, dunya reason, besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, so what do we mean by that? Let's say, for example, uh, a person is making uh, wudu, right? You're making wudu, alright? So, and your intention is, is solely, sincerely for Allah's sake, but you also want to cool off because it's very hot that day, right? It's very hot that day, and you also want to cool off, alright? So you're not doing it for anybody else's sake, but you do have another reason why you're doing it, alright? Which is, you want to cool off, it's very hot, and you want to make wudu to cool off. Is that action rejected? Not necessarily, all right? So for something like this, a person will get reward proportional to their niyyah, right? Or for example, a person is, uh, they're, they're traveling, right? I'm traveling and um, I'm passing by Mecca. So I'm doing business, uh, let's say in Mecca. I'm going there for business in Mecca. And at the same time, I want to make Umrah. So I'm there for two reasons. All right? I'm there to make Umrah, but I also want to do some trade and business. All right? Is that action rejected? Not necessarily. The action will be valid, but the reward will be proportional to how much of that action was right, just for the Umrah and how much is it for the trade and profit. All right? So if a person does an action, and this act of worship, all right, uh, there's another dunya reason for, uh, that it's done for. It doesn't necessarily nullify the action, but the reward can be diminished. Right? The, work, the reward can be diminished. All right? So the, the only time the action is rejected is when you do it for somebody else's sake. All right? When you do it for somebody else's sake, then the action is rejected. But if a person does it only for Allah's sake, but then there's another reason, a dunya reason, worldly reason, then the action is not necessarily rejected, it will still be valid, but the reward can be diminished. Right, the work can be diminished. All right, uh, coming back to the hadith. Uh, so, if we go back to the hadith, 
that إنما الأعمال بالنيات وإنما لكل امرئ ما نوى فمن كانت هجرته إلى الله ورسوله فهجرته إلى الله ورسوله ومن كانت هجرته لدنيا ليصيبها أو امرأة ينكحها فهجرته إلى ما هجر إليه رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم says that the deeds are considered by the intentions and the person will get the reward according to his intention so whoever immigrated for Allah and his messenger his immigration will be for Allah and his messenger and whoever immigrated for worldly benefits or for a woman to marry his immigration will be for what he immigrated for so uh, it's mentioned that the reason why this, uh, this uh, statement was made by Rasulullah is that during the, the hijrah, when they migrated from Mecca to Medina, there was a man who migrated and he migrated to marry a woman. And this woman was named uh, Um Qais. Right? She was named Um Qais. And so this, this individual, he migrated not because he wanted to go from Darul Kufr to Darul Islam, but he was, mar he was going there just to marry this woman. And so this person became known as Muhajir Um Qais, the one who immigrated for the sake of Um Qais. All right, so this is the reason why this hadith was mentioned. So Rasulullah is clarifying that uh, the Hijrah can have different intentions. As we mentioned before, right? The Hijrah is one of those things that it's an act of worship which can be confused or which can resembles uh, a normal action, right? Because a person can be making hijrah and it can be for Allah and His Messenger. Or a person can be making hijrah and it can be for marriage. Or a person can be making hijrah, it can be for trade or profit. All right? So this is one of those actions that it resembles a normal action. And so as we said, right, those actions that resemble normal actions, they require an intention. Right? Because otherwise, if you don't have an intention, then uh, how are we going to distinguish a person making hijrah for Allah's sake versus a person making hijrah for marriage or for anything else? So this act of hijrah, it requires an intention. All right? So certain people, they made hijrah for Allah and His Messenger. And certain people, they made hijrah for other reasons, for marriage or for anything else. So this particular uh, individual, all right, he made the uh, hijrah not for Allah's sake, but for marriage to this particular woman. And so Rasulullah is clarifying that this action that a person did, if you want to receive the reward for it, if you want your hijrah to be rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it needs to be with the intention. And if you did not have that intention, then you will not receive the reward. So whoever intended to make hijrah for marriage, then they're not going to get the reward as the one who, in, who made uh, intention to emigrate for Allah and His Messenger's sake. All right. Um, we know in the hadith that Rasulullah says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ Actions are by intentions. وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى And every person will have what they intended for. Is there any difference between the, these two statements? Or are they the same thing? Some scholars said that they are essentially the same thing. And one, the second statement is emphasizing the first statement. Right? So that's one position of the scholars. That they, they essentially mean the same thing. Another scholar said no, that actually there's a difference between the two. What's that difference is that the first statement is talking about acceptance of actions, meaning actions are not accepted except with an intention. If you didn't have an intention, then that action is not going to be accepted. <inaudible> meaning actions, in order for them to be accepted and valid, they need to have an intention, a valid intention. As for the second statement, <inaudible> and for everyone will have what they intended for, this is referring to reward. So this is talking about the second statement is talking about reward. So the first statement is talking about actions are accepting, accepted by intention. The second statement is talking about reward of the actions. Right? You will receive reward based on what you intend. All right. Uh, the question comes up now. Uh, we see in the hadith that Rasulullah SAW is clearly um, indicating that the one who did not make intention for Allah and His Messenger that they are, are blameworthy, right? The, the hadith clearly seems to give that indication, indication that the one who made hijrah for dunya, yusibuha, or yankihuha, then that person is, kind of, is blameworthy for that, right? This, this, this is what the, the hadith seems to imply. But is it permissible for a person to migrate for a worldly reason? Right? Can a person migrate for a worldly reason? Is that permissible? Anyone? Yes, all right? So it's, it's okay, right? So a person receives a job offer in a different state or a different country, and you take that job offer. Are you, are you sinful for doing so? 
No, right? Or you receive a marriage proposal from somebody else in a different city or different country or different state, and you migrate to that, st that different locality to marry. Is that permissible? That's permissible. You're not sinful for that, right? So why, is it, why does it seem that Rasulullah is, is blaming the person who performed hijrah to marry if this is something permissible to begin with, right? It's permissible to go and migrate for marriage, right? Somebody, you receive a marriage proposal and you migrate to a different country or a different state, that's, that's completely fine. People do that all the time, right? Anybody here married for a green card, right? <laughs> right? People marry all the time, right? For, uh, for, and, and they, they travel and they, and they move for marriage purposes or for job purposes. So this is, this is fine. So why does it seem that Rasulullah is blaming the person who did this? Anybody? Yeah. Okay. So this said was established in Islam. But, but this action that the person did, is he sinful for doing so? No. Right, so why does it seem that he's being blamed for doing that? Right, good. It, it, essentially, that's what it is, is that this act, even though it's permissible for him to migrate to Medina and marry that woman, that's, that's fine. But because this was an action that on the outward, it was, should only have been done for Allah's sake, and because he made it seem as though he's migrating for Allah and his messenger's sake, this is where the blame comes in, right? That he made it seem as though he is migrating for... Allah and his messenger, when in reality he was marrying to marry a woman. Right? If he had you know, indicated from the very beginning, I'm migrating to Medina to marry this woman, then this would have been, he, wouldn't have, he would not be blamed, or this would be permissible. He would have lost out on a big reward, right? which is attaining the reward of the hijrah, but he would not have been blameworthy for doing so. So the blame is basically that he made it seem as though he's migrating for Allah and his messenger, when in reality he was migrating for a worldly purpose. Not because, not necessarily because he was, he migrated for a worldly purpose that that's why he was being blamed. Right? So, uh, in essence, his action was not sinful and uh, he was not blameworthy for the action itself, but he was blameworthy because of making it seem as though he was doing this action for Allah and his messenger's sake and he was not doing so. Alright? And so this is the reason why Rasulullah some uh, seems to uh, blame this person or, or seem, make, it, make it appear blameworthy for doing so, even though uh, this action in itself is something permissible. All right, uh, so <clears throat> uh, with that, we conclude uh, today's session. So uh, everything uh, we have mentioned today about you know, the, the, the purpose of the intention, the, what the intention does, uh, distinguishing between acts of worship, distinguishing between uh, an act of worship and a normal action, right? All of this is, uh, this, this is, lays the ground of all the hadith that are going to come afterwards. So after we have explained these important points, then afterwards, inshallah, in the remaining weeks, we're going to explain the, the rest of the hadith, um, having, ha, ha, using these points that we have established today as a foundation for the rest uh, of the hadith that will come up later on, inshallah. All right, so we'll open the floor for any questions. Yeah. Question about istikhara, like uh, istikhara in uh, give, give, give an example. So like if it's uh, so okay, like uh, making sure I'm not in the same uh -huh. uh, the same thing why would you say istikhara uh, for if I should uh, take this job or not take this job? You know, in other words, it's totally different uh, intention. One one says two are past, there's several different ideas. Oh, so so a person has different decisions to make. You have different decisions. And you want to pray one istikhara salah for that. So you, you can do that. You can pray the two rakats, but then in your, when you make the dua, you mention each individually. You, meet, you mention each individually. 
because you're asking Allah for guidance on a specific, something specific. So you mention each individually. If this matter is good for me, then grant it to me. And then you move on to the second one and the third one, if you have multiple ones. All right, so you, 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 can, you, can, you can pray two, you don't have to pray multiple rakat, you can pray two. You can, you can do more if you want, but you, you don't necessarily have to do more. You can pray the two rakat, but then when you make the dua of istikhara, you would mention each individually. All right, uh, mention each individually. All right, any other questions? Yes. Okay, so this is a Friday class. We have every Friday, inshallah. Every Friday. So you're invited to come next Friday, same time, inshallah. Oh, yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, so uh, we'll conclude with that for today. Uh, and in the... Uh, Next session, we'll continue on with the chapter on sincerity and intention and mention uh, the remaining hadith. So there, as we said, there's about 12 hadith uh, in this chapter. We just completed the first hadith today. Uh, we spent a little extra on this first hadith establishing the foundations. And after that, uh, the rest of the sessions will be explaining the rest of the hadith. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you combine intentions for non-fard? Yes. All right. So the, yeah. So the question is clear, right? Can you intine, combine intentions? It will depend. It will it depend on uh, the, the the nature of the act of worship. So some some you might be able to do so, and some you might not. For example, uh, when it comes to uh, coming in and offering tahiyyat to the masjid, right? Offering the 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 two rakats of greeting the masjid, right? And then. The sunnah of, for example, before Fajr. You can combine those two together. All right? Because Tahiyyut al Masjid is not intended in and of itself. Tahiyyut al Masjid is there to make sure that the first thing you do before you sit is to offer a salah. Whether that salah is a fart salah or whether that is a sunnah salah, the important thing is that you offer a salah before you sit down. This is the purpose of Tahiyyut al Masjid. So you can combine that with the sunnah before Fajr or any other sunnah. All right, you can so that you can combine together. All right, so it would depend on the nature of the salah. Uh, would we be would be the answer to that question? So something like tahiyyat al-masjid, you can combine it with other uh, salawat. Others not necessarily. Allah Yeah. Right. Right. So the fasting by Ashura. Yeah. You can, so you can combine those together. I can intend to fast because it's Monday. And I can also intend to fast because it is the day of Ashura. And you will get, inshallah, the reward for both of them. The reward for both. All right? Uh, yes? You can. Yes, you can. You can do that as well. You can combine them too, uh, as well. All right, we have some um, refreshments in the back, inshallah. So before uh, the adhan, everyone is invited to take part in some refreshments uh, before we uh, go into the salah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Subhanakallahu wa bihamdik. Nashadu wa la ilaha ila ant. Nashadu wa la ilaha ila ant.